On primetime politics tonight, the Prime Minister announces a deal to make COVID-19 vaccines in Canada. But will the production come too late to make a difference? I'll speak with Industry Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne, and opposition MPs will respond. And the growing concern over COVID-19 variants. Total infections may be declining in Canada, but that could change and change rapidly. This expert will explain what could happen and how we can prevent a disaster. We will begin tonight with news that Canada has signed a tentative deal to produce COVID-19 vaccines in this country. The agreement is with pharmaceutical company Novavax, hinging on the approval by Health Canada of the company's vaccine. The manufacturing will happen at a National Research Council facility still being built in Montreal. The Prime Minister announced the deal today, saying the company could begin producing vaccines by late summer. But the Minister of Industry suggests it will be later than that. Eventually, the company will produce up to 2 million doses a month. Another company, Precision Nanosystems, is on track to make vaccines in Canada as well, but there are no details of that agreement yet. The Prime Minister was asked why it's taken so long to get a deal that will see vaccines produced in Canada, but not until the end of Canada's vaccine rollout this fall. Our uh, initial plan on vaccines was to sign uh, as many different contracts with as many different producers, uh, potential producers of vaccines as possible. And that's what we did. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we are now seeing many different vaccines uh, looking to coming to Canada. We're be able to source and ensure that uh, we're able to, uh, to, to confidently say that not only will we uh, get 3 million Canadians vaccinated by the end of March, uh, we will have everyone who needs to be vaccinated by September. Uh, and we all hope that that is all that we're going to need. Uh, but as we see new variants rising, as we see a virus that will continue to uh, be uh, present in many places around the world. We don't know what the future looks like for a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. What we're very clear on is Canada will be uh, developing domestic manufacturing. So regardless of what could happen in the future, uh, we will have domestic production on top of all our partnerships and, uh, and contracts signed with companies around the world. Canada already has agreements with Novavax to buy 52 million doses of its two-dose vaccine. Here's how opposition leaders reacted to the news of a deal for domestic COVID vaccine production. Well, thank you, Ryan. This underscores there has never been a, a plan with this government to manufacture and secure capacity for vaccines here. We were late on rapid tests, late on vaccines, and each week the news gets worse in terms of Canada not receiving access from overseas and not having the capacity. We need vaccines to turn the corner on COVID-19. And they should have learned the lesson from the first wave of the, of the pandemic. If you're not producing PPE, rapid tests, or vaccines at home, you can't count on getting them from abroad to secure that economic future. We need to do better. While this is good news, and it is a positive thing to produce the vaccine in Canada, it is very late. We've known about the importance of vaccines for some time now. And it really raises the question, why wasn't this negotiated, this ability to produce the vaccine in Canada domestically? Why wasn't this negotiated for the other vaccines? François-Philippe Champagne is Canada's Minister of Industry, and he joins me now, as you can see, to discuss the deal to manufacture vaccines in Canada. Minister Champagne, uh, great to see you again. Thanks for taking time. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you and the whole CPAC uh, team, I would say. OK, thanks for uh, making time for us. There's Look, there's some confusion today over when the vaccines could be produced at the uh, facility in Montreal. The prime minister said late summer. You said end of the year. Which is it? Well, it's very simple. Uh, this is a facility which we're retooling. As you know, we've announced uh, uh, back a few months ago that we were making significant investment at the National uh, Research Council in, in Royal Mount uh, to have a manufacturing facility. The big news is that Novavax, we found a partner which has a vaccine which is compatible with the type of manufacturing uh, we have there. So it's very simple. You have a construction phase, uh, which will be finished by the end of the summer. Then you have a certification phase by Health Canada, what we call the good manufacturing practice, which is uh, consistent for all, uh, you know, plants that mm. you would have in Canada, which wants to do biomanufacturing, and then you move to production. 
So that's why I said construction will be by the end of the summer. Then you have a buffer of a few months for certification, and and no one can tell exactly because, as you know, this right. is an independent process. I mean, so to be and clear, they, so to be clear, we're look, we're we, there are no vaccines likely rolling off a production line uh, before the end of the year. Well, and and let's not confuse things. So the contract we have with Novavax for more than fifty million vaccines that continues. Right. This is different. This is about yeah, biomanufacturing in Canada. This is about resiliency. This is about bringing another pillar to make sure that Canadians, uh, you know, whatever may come next, that we will have our domestic biomanufacturing. We invested in Medicago in Quebec. We've invested in Abcelera in Vancouver. We've invested with Vido in Saskatchewan. What I'm trying to do and what we've been working on is to have many pillars to ensure that whatever may come, uh, Canadians would have so as much of the supply chain we need to make sure that we produce vaccine in Canada right. for you, Canadians. But you, you, you've mentioned we're getting, we'll be, we'll be getting doses from uh, Novavax from, that are not manufactured in Canada. But given the government's announced timeline of, of vaccinating all Canadians who want a vaccine by September, uh, and we'll have to use imported vaccines for that, how, how would the Novavax vaccines be used if the vaccination campaign is already over? Well, it's because... <laughs> One thing you assume there, Peter, is what's next? I mean, I think that it would be prudent and of your viewers would expect a government which is responsible to make sure that we have the domestic capability. Uh, we see new variants. Uh, we want to make sure that we are resilient for the future. And, and if it's not for COVID, uh, we'll use them for other things. I, I think that, you know, we start from a low base since 1980s. These companies have been leaving Canada, different mm -hmm. governments, different decisions. But I think it would, it's, it's only normal, and I would say prudent, uh, and, and certainly as Minister of Industry, trust me, I want to make sure that whatever may comes next, that we have as much of the domestic capabilities to produce okay. it, that we'll be reliant, whether it's about vaccines, whether it's about uh, personal equipment, whatever might be critical to protect the health and safety of Canadians. Okay. You're, we you're in Canada. Your department's been in discussions with vaccine makers for, for months to make their vaccines in Canada without any luck until now. What special incentives did you provide Novavax to get them to set up in Canada? Well, I would say, yeah, we've been in touch with many and we continue. You know me. Uh, we'll make sure we speak to everyone. Right, but did and you provide them any special incentives to, to finally get them to say yes to the I offer to set up in Canada? Listen, I spoke to this CEO many times, and what makes that what makes Canada attractive in particular is, is the skilled workforce, stability, predictability. They've seen what Canada has been doing during this pandemic, and they were happy to partner with Canada. Obviously, we'll have to uh, negotiate what may come next, but certainly what we have now, and that's the big news. Because right. when I talk to the CEO, Peter, you have to know that they produce in about seven or eight countries around the world. They couldn't have gone anywhere. Right. Uh, so did you, are, are you offering them any special financial incentives to set up shop here? Well, we will certainly, and that's part of the negotiations to come, we will certainly be a financial partner with them. I think that Canadians understand this is about uh, making sure we are resilient. And in times like that, uh, we want to make sure that we would have the pillars of resiliency that Canadians never find themselves again in a position where we started with a very low base when it comes to biomanufacturing. And we'll make the strategic investments today with a long-term vision to be resilient, uh, to make sure that we create good jobs, because those are very, very good jobs, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, that we're going to be creating here. And also that we, we build all the, the, the supply chain. This, this is great. This is great for Canada. I yeah, mean, okay. the, imagine, the, 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 shows Canada. They could have gone anywhere. Okay, they, they there, started, there, there have been there have been calls for there have been calls in this country uh, for domestic vaccine production for essentially since the pandemic began. Uh, Britain had virtually no domestic production, so it's set up to build its own, and it's doing that. Um, what's taken so long for that to happen in Canada? Well, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic on March 11, and in March 23rd, we made significant investment. Just look at Medicago in Quebec City. We've invested 173 million to to speed up. This is like an Apollo project. These companies are working a, a, as quickly as they can to build a manufacturing. You look at Vido in Saskatchewan, same thing. You look at Abcelera in Vancouver, same thing. So we've been, you know, days after it was declared a pandemic, we have made the strategic investment. And what you saw today is is yet an additional pillar to make sure that we have as many. Uh, you know, manufacture as possible in Canada. There's different vaccine streams. The good thing is that the Novavax vaccine uh, could be manufactured at the facility in Royal Mount. They were willing to work with mm -hmm. Canada. 
and, and they are one of the leading candidates. You saw yeah. Pfizer, you saw Moderna, you saw Novavax supplying here in Canada. This is the great news. They, mm -hmm. they, they decide to come to Canada, and we really want for Canadians uh, to be resilient. You, you touched on it. You, you touched on it uh, in your comments a few moments ago that not too long, it wasn't too long ago, and Canada did have a rel relatively vibrant manufacturing uh, sector in pharma, but those companies have left. Uh, is, do, you, do you see this now as, as the beginning of a, of a rapid uh, but in, intensive rebuilding process to put Canada back in that game? Totally. And, and when you mentioned the United Kingdom, we started with a very different base. Uh, the United Kingdom had much more scale in terms of, of domestic capabilities. When, when the pandemic was declared, we scouted the Canadian market and looked at the producers and manufacturers. And we realized, like you said, since the 1980s, uh, these companies have been, have been leaving Canada, whether it's about supply chain, whether it's different governments, different policies. But we started from a very low base in terms of domestic manufacturing. That's why we, we needed to make these strategic investments to have domestic capabilities. And that's why we needed with the experts, you know, we have the, the vaccine tax force. We, we went to the best expert, the best mind in our country to say, where should we invest? How can we invest strategically so that these plants would come online as quickly as possible are for Canadians? And people who are watching know that when you're building these plants, normally you're talking about two, three years. What we're doing at Royal Mountain months, uh, th that's really extraordinary uh, to be able to, to go because you're building, you're, you're manufacturing vaccine. So that, that's quite significant when, it, when you look at the processes and the health and safety procedure you need to okay. respect, obviously, to protect the health of people. Uh, Francois-Philippe Champagne, always good to uh, speak with you. Thanks for your time tonight, Minister. Take care. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, let's hear the view from uh, federal opposition parties on the vaccine announcement today. Let's bring in James Cumming. He's the industry critic for the official opposition conservatives. And Don Davies is the health critic for the NDP. Gentlemen, good to see you both. Thanks for being uh, with me this evening. And Mr. Cumming, let me start with you. What is your reaction to the news that the federal government now has a deal with Novavax to manufacture vaccines in Canada starting later this year? Well, I think it's good that um, that we're finally seeing some traction on this. Uh, it's good to see that we're we're at least finding out what the use for the Royal Mount facility would be. Um, I would tell you, though, my initial reaction was late to the game. Uh, we've been knowing that we have a manufacturing issue uh, from before May of last year. So when this virus started to take hold of Canada. Uh, it looked like the government spent a lot of their time and a lot of their effort towards the CanSino deal, uh, which is what originally the uh, Royal Mount facility was targeted for. And there seems to be a lack of, um, uh, I don't think it's interest, but aggressiveness to look at manufacturing. Hmm. You know, we heard from Sir John Bell the other day was interviewed and, and went through how the UK recognized the importance of having manufacturing. And they got on this early. And they actually have manufacturing production now oh. versus waiting versus to, it looks like the, at the best will be the end of this year. All right, so uh, you're, which you, is you, good. You, I'm glad that they're doing right. that, but it's late to the game. Okay, good step forward, but late to the game. Uh, Don Davies, what's your view? Well, I'm, I'm kind of similar to that. I mean, uh, we're always going to applaud any ability of Canada to uh, to enhance and build our domestic vaccine and, and essential medicine production capacity. But, you know, I can't help but to note that we never should have been in this position in the first place. And uh, never again should we be in this position. And there's a history to this, you know, Canada at one time owned a Crown Corporation, Connaught Labs, the Conservatives sold that off in the mid 80s and successive Liberal and Conservative governments never did anything in that regard. And it took, frankly, a, a global health emergency to expose that vulnerability. And now when Canada is vulnerable to other countries and other companies that are based in other countries for essential vaccines or medicine, you know, I think it shows just what a poor policy decision that was. So, um, you know, we've been calling for the creation of another Crown Corporation for months now. And I think we need to accelerate our ability in that regard. Okay, I want to come back to that. The government has been, uh, we heard today, Mr. Cumming, the government's been trying since early in the pandemic to get vaccine makers to locate in Canada with no luck until now. Uh, I spoke to the Minister of Industry uh, just now, and he wouldn't answer directly whether Canada had provided any economic incentives to get Novavax to manufacture here. 
So I guess I'm wondering, what, what questions do you have about the deal with uh, that company? And does, it, does this speak to the fact that even uh, that we haven't seen any of the vaccine contracts, including the one with Novavax? Well, there's a huge issue on transparency again. We don't know what the deal is. We don't know what the government agreed to. We don't know. They've got purchase orders out to seven different companies. We've never seen the terms of the deal. In the U.S., they've announced what their acquisitions look like, so you're able to see the contracts. So provinces and, and other governments can react better to it. But but I, I, I challenge here with, you know, there's been five years with this government where they've been able to deal with uh, with issues around manufacturing. And we've heard from manufacturers, vaccine manufacturers in Canada, that say that they are capable of producing a vaccine and quite frankly would be capable of manufacturing a vaccine. And we've seen a slow reaction by this government, $400 billion being spent, and a very, very small portion of that but is to gone Mr. into to, to Mr. Davies, Canadian manufacturing. Yeah. To Mr. Davies' point, though, I mean, this goes back a, a several decades, a, a sort of gutting of Canada's ability to uh, manufacture these vaccines, to be able to uh, have those kinds of mechanisms in place. Uh, would you acknowledge that, that uh, there's, there's maybe some blame to go around here and lots of room to grow to, to make sure Canada is better at this? Sure, let's play the blame game. Let's go back five years, 10 years. Here's the facts. The facts are that we've got companies like Entos. We've got companies like Providence. We've got uh, uh, the UK has demonstrated that you can react quickly and get back into manufacturing games. So uh, to me, uh, you know, it can be done. You know, how the UK looked at it differently is they looked at how can we repurpose facilities to get them up quicker and then take away that construction time around, you know, foundations, footings, getting a building built when uh, there, there probably is facilities and capacity in Canada if it's repurposed. All right. And Mr. Davies, the government says this is a, uh, a key step in, in making sure Canada is now, from now on, better prepared for major threats like pandemics and a major step in rebuilding the pharma sector in Canada to produce vaccines and critical drugs. Uh, and I guess I'm wondering whether your party supports, you've talked about creating a, a, a federal agency, a public agency. Would your party support patent protections or uh, better tax breaks for pharma companies to make that happen? I, I don't think that's the right policy uh, response, Peter. And, you know, it's not a blame game. It's an accountability exercise and an attempt to understand how we got to where we are so that we don't repeat those mistakes. You know, the truth is, Peter, with vaccines, it's generally not a moneymaker for the pharmaceutical industry. You know, they're really in the business of finding those big drugs that they can get repeat customers for. And this is one of the structural problems with developing vaccines. It's it's why Companies never developed uh, or went with the Ebola vaccine that was developed because right, right. but in an era stuff. in an era of, uh, of of coronaviruses and and predictions that we'll get a lot more of them, maybe it is now a, a money making area well, for companies. Well, it might, and that's why I think we need a, a unique policy response, which is why I think a crown corporation and a public enterprise is what's required in this in this regard. But but uh, you know, James is quite right about the transparency and accountability problems of this government. You know, Prime Minister Trudeau last August stood out and and said that we'd be producing millions of vaccines at the NRC facility by the end of 2020. That never happened. Uh, You know, he tells us that the EU export controls won't affect Canada, but we're not on the EU exemptions list. Um, You know, he keeps telling us we're on track to meet our our procurement uh, targets, but he won't release any of the contracts that actually reveal the supply schedules. So, Transparency, accountability, and credibility are critical in maintaining public confidence in a, in a time of, of pandemic. And so okay. while the announcement today is positive, you know, the proof's in the pudding, and I hear a lot of words from this government, it's time that we see some action, not just some some promised uh, response that's going to happen years in the future, which is really what was announced today. You know, Mr. Cumming, we've talked about uh, some of the... the uh, uh, the pharma sector that we've lost in this country, and let's leave that to the the side to talk about looking forward. So, do, do what do you think the way forward is? Uh, Mr. Davies is talking about a public agency uh, uh, to do vaccines and critical drugs. Uh, uh, where where are you on the notion of tax breaks and incentives and uh, those kinds of measures to be able to bring big pharma companies back? Well, I th- I think we have a tremendous sector in this country of of uh, that has capacity to develop vaccines. And we've heard from several of those companies that believe that they have both the capacity to develop the vaccines and to be able to manufacture. So I would think that a combination of a public-private sector partnership 
and, and structure it in such a fashion that there is continuity to make sure that uh, that IP or, the, mm. or uh, those entities that you're helping fund uh, have to remain in Canada and have to keep that production in Canada. I think that's doable. And, um, and I think, quite frankly, many of these companies would welcome it. And many of them have complained over the years about uh, the erosion of patent protections and so on, which is uh, another big issue, Mr. Davies. If they, you know, what's, what's the incentive to do business in Canada? Or is that the point of creating your own agency, period? Well, well, the truth is, is that uh, the policy of the Canadian government for the last, say, 30 years has been really to work with the private pharmaceutical industry. We have extended patent protection. Mm-hmm. We have uh, enlarged protection in trade bills that that enhance intellectual property protections. And frankly, I mean, even recently, for the third time, this government delayed changes to the PMPRB, which would have cut into pharmacy profits. Look, it's not a problem of profits. Pfizer averages $40 billion of profits a year. The collective profits worldwide of the top 35 pharmaceutical companies since 2000 is $8 trillion. It's a profitable sector. What we need to do is figure out how can we better organize research and development for those kinds of public health initiatives that don't really fit the private sector model. And that's why we think that you need to have a public drug manufacturing Canada okay. to fill well, those gaps where the private sector we'll just to, isn't doing it. have to leave it there, gentlemen. Thank you both for your time tonight. Uh, an issue we'll Great. keep pursuing, no doubt, uh, but thank you both for taking time. Great. Thank, thank you, Peter. Peter. Well, let's shift our focus now to what is happening with the COVID-19 virus in Canada. Nationally, new infections are declining, but there's growing concern about the new variants of COVID-19 spreading in this country. Variants from Great Britain and South Africa have been showing up across Canada, even as some provinces begin to ease restrictions. Is that a good idea right now? And where could we be headed if we don't get the variant spread under control? Carolyn Colain is the Canada 150 Research Chair in Mathematics for Infection, Evolution and Public Health at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. She joins me now. Uh, Professor, good to see you. Thanks for taking time to speak with me today. Uh, I do appreciate it. Hello. Uh, You have just completed some modeling on on the case trajectory we could see if these new COVID-19 variants get established in Canada. So if I can, I want to start there. Uh, We have some 150 cases of the variant uh, variants detected in this country so far. So does that make them established? Can I start there? Are the variants established yet in Canada? I think that's a challenge. With 150 detected, there might still be many more undetected because, of course, we're not sequencing every single case. We hope that's not true. We hope we've we've got a handle on what's here. Um, but even if the, you know if there are 150 and uh, the transmission rate is higher than with regular COVID and we're somewhat struggling to control regular COVID, it's it's been hard. Um, I, I would say the chance that these are established or will establish very soon is pretty high, unfortunately. What, what makes the variants, at least what we've seen so far, what, what makes them so worrisome? So I think what, what I'm worried about is the really strong evidence from the UK, just because they have, they have such great data there, that there is a higher transmission rate. And whether that's because of better binding for, for the virus to our cells um, or, or because of the other genetic changes, it has. There seems to be pretty strong evidence that, that that transmission rate is higher than what we have or have had in the variants so far. So, And that's 40 to 80 percent higher transmission. And that's just a real concern because that just means more of those contacts that, that are exposed get infected, maybe more casual contacts, maybe it can exploit the aerosol route even more efficiently or... Um, otherwise transmit to more people in the same amount of time. And that's just a concern because we're, you know, barely able to contain COVID in our own, uh, you know, the COVID that we've had so far. Oh, okay. Um, so, I mean, there's evidence at, at any level that the, the, you know, the tighter restrictions you have, the more measures you take, uh, they do help limit the spread of the virus in any form, whether it's the original COVID we know of or the variants. If we fail to contain it now, and I'm talking specifically about the variants, uh, what will happen and how quickly? Right. So what happens is exponential growth. Uh, That's what failure to contain means. And that doubling time can be faster than our doubling times with regular COVID. So you might see a doubling time of, of 10 days, for example, instead of, say, 30 days or 30 or 5 days, which had been typical in Ontario over the past uh, month or two before the decline started. 
uh, what we're estimating is that the current measures, especially places like BC that are pretty flat, we're kind of containing our COVID, but those measures won't work if the transmission rate is higher, 40% higher. And so what we see is that, you know, we don't see much for a while because the, even if the variant establishes, it's, you know, three cases, 10, 20, 30. Uh, but then when that wall of exponential growth starts to become apparent, we have a doubling time that is faster and we see that exponential wall uh, in March. I think, you know, those are walls that look terrible on plots of models and they're- How, they're how terrible? Uh, they look terrible. They're they're kind of like having a flashlight. You know, that doesn't mean you're going to walk into that cliff that you see when you turn on your flashlight. It's nice to have the flashlight to see that the cliff is there and hopefully we avoid it. So most jurisdictions in Canada have not, uh, well, all of us have acted before we started seeing 20,000 daily cases in our own province. And we'll probably do that again. So we don't let those walls go. But I think the challenge is that we need to do even more than we've than we've had to do because the transmission rate's higher. So that would mean more what? More distancing, more wider testing, more um, more or faster or different contact tracing, uh, combinations of all of those things. And I think that's going to be a huge challenge if, so, it, if it does come to that. So where where we are then in in uh, uh, in the sort of transmission of the variant process. And here we are, we have some provinces talking about relaxing restrictions. Uh, schools back for a lot of students in Ontario, Quebec's talking about uh, loosening some of the restrictions, other provinces as well. Is, is that a bad idea uh, until we see exactly what these variants are doing? Yeah, it's hard to say what's a bad idea. You know, bad for what? Um, bad for risking that COVID variants with high transmission uh, rise in frequency. Yeah, that, that's, that's a huge risk that we're taking. That said, I do think we need a strategic plan, and I think that strategic plan needs to look towards reopening. We can't be waiting until September under stay-at-home orders and curfews and widespread lockdowns and huge sectors mm. closed. I hope we don't have to, and I fear that if we don't take a strategic view now, that's what we're going to have to be doing until September, and it's tremendously damaging and tremendously expensive. I would rather see containment of this today, offsetting that problem in March, containment of the rest of COVID today, but then looking towards ways that we can reopen, ways we can use our new technologies, the rapid testing, ways that we can use um, you know, more targeted controls, more recognition of aerosols, more uh, screens and these things to kind of support reopening, because I don't think what we want to say is, all right, then lockdowns forever because of new variants. That's not that's not a strategic choice for Canada. All right. So lots to consider there. Uh, Caroline Colleen, thanks so much for your time today and uh, looking forward to talking again. Take care. You're very welcome. That is all the time we have for this edition of Primetime Politics. From all of us here at CPAC, I'm Peter Van Dusen. Thanks for watching. See you next time.